expecting other people to do more for us is over. The opportunity is here. It was, to me, it was just a great example of how God forgives and, and redemption is possible. They were blind. You couldn't see. I don't feel bad. I feel sad that it was that way. Sick and tired of all of you. I'm taking you to jail. In fact, all of you getting a pack wagon, let's go. I wanted to forget about what I'd promised God. I knew I'd promised him that. I knew I'd said it. And now I'm out. My name is Vera Mae Perkins, and I'm 76 years old. I was born in near New Haven, Mississippi. I was born in, in the woods, down in New Haven, Mississippi, with a midwife as the doctor. Back 75 years ago, we weren't seeing doctors. We had a midwife when we had babies. And I was born, and she must have done a good job. I was born on Mr. Van Turnage's place. That's where my father and mother was sharecropping, and I don't know how many other people were sharecropping on that place. There was a, a preacher came through our community and was telling all the old folks, this was 75 years ago now, telling all the old folks to buy some land. Buy some land, and Grandpa bought land. Um, my mother, uh, after my birth, she was very sick, and she was, as I understand, was nothing but skin and bone. And, uh, and I, uh, she died. I lived, and my grandmother, my father took the five of us and dropped us off at my grandmother Babe Perkins' house. And that she had so many other of her daughter's children that she ended up giving away three of my five. We had to go to the Mississippi Delta and pick cotton to get our winter clothes. And we would stay up there and pick cotton until after Thanksgiving which was the 1st of November. And that's when I got in school every year, 1st of November, during my junior high years. And it was tough for me. Uh, I guess growing up without a mother and growing up in a big family of cousins where they had their mother and I didn't have mine, uh, I think I was always seeking to be loved. I look back at it today seeking to be accepted. When we'd be in the field picking cotton or horn or doing something, and they'd ask somebody to go with some water or something, I would always volunteer to do it. And I would always run to do it. And I would do it because they would always say something very nice to me. You, you, you did that quickly. You brought the water back and that kind of stuff. I think lacking that nurture, I grew up for that affirmation. We never had a, a new sheet. We had fertilized sack sheet. Grandma would take four sacks, wash them, you know, wash the sacks, and get them nice and sew them in the middle and crossway. And you had a sheet, and she would hem it. And that was our sheets as I was growing up. We never had a new sheet as I was growing up. And then, uh, my father was going to come to visit me. That was the big deal in my life. Uh, I had probably I had saw him, but never had a deep memory of him until that night. He came, I must have been about three years old, three or so years old. He came and we was waiting up for him. I tried to stay up but went to sleep. But finally he came that evening in the night and he came back to the bed and woke me up and got me in his arms and was calling me baby. And nobody else had called me baby. That was strange, but it felt good that there was somebody I belonged to. 
I had a balloon in. And um, then we went to bed, went to sleep. I, I guess I fell asleep. Next morning, I couldn't hardly wait to, to get up to be with my father. And everywhere he would go in the house, I would be with him. And then it come about one o'clock when on a Saturday, and it come everybody would go to town on a Saturday, and I didn't realize that he was going to go to town, and from going to town he was going to catch a ride to Columbia, and go back home. But uh, when he got ready to go down that track, I can remember I wanted to go with him. I wanted to go with him, and he tried to get me to not go. And a lot of people around the house there, and I, every time he would tell me not to go, I would keep coming and I would just be crying and finally going down the lane to the railroad track. And then he got up on the railroad track and I kept coming behind him. He had got him a switch to whip me. And then what I did was I would stay farther enough from him in order to, for him not to, I could run when he come back, but close enough to him that I wouldn't lose sight of him. And I was just crying all the way. And finally, my aunt came up on the railroad track and uh, got me and, and helped me to understand that I couldn't, it didn't get me to understand I couldn't go, but tried to make me understand. And then when I looked up, my father was way down the road and I knew he was, uh, he was gone. My, my daddy then had like went out of my life to a certain degree, but he didn't because he had laid the point of view of what love is. And I think the rest of my life then until I found Christ was a seeking for that father's love. My father laid a foundation for love. Naturally that a wife and children was a part of it. Naturally that all of that was a part of it. And um, I, that, might have, that might have helped me through life. Uh, my, my uncle and brother was very close in our life, and they came out to serve. By this time, we are uh, teenagers, you, you know, and we are working too. But our life got, took on a complete change. Uh, they had enriched our life, and we were proud of them. And then my brother uh, uh, came back, and about six months after he was back, he was killed. Well, he and his girl was talking in the alley, and they might have been arguing, you know what I mean, talking loud in the line, or wasn't afraid to talk loud or something, and probably talking louder than other people. And he came up behind my brother and hit him on the head with a blackjack. And my brother spin around, being a military person, like he was gonna catch the gun. And the guy shot him two times. And that was that. The night he was killed, we was all in town. And uh, when they shot him, I was, at another little, 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 uh, like a little honky tonk they had, just a little, about just on the edge of town, and we heard that he was shot. People thought that there was really going to be a riot, and a, and a, and the policemen thought because when I come in there, I watch the white man, uh, another white man, come in there and give the white the other policeman some more ammunition, if he needed, it. and then of course they. The doctor said he couldn't do any more with him. We put him in the back of my cousin's car, and then we took off to, uh, to Jackson. And he was just grunting all the way to Jackson. I remember I put my hand on my brother's head and said, uh, man, you can't die. And it was like he took my hand off of his head like he pushed my hand off in the head. That was sort of, uh, it was a strange feeling. They took him in the hospital. He was pretty, uh, probably done bled, almost to death inside. And then in an hour or so later, they came out and said that he was, uh, he was dead. All the blacks started leaving Mendenhall. M not Mendenhall, but New Hebron, that little town. But the other blacks who stayed, they was even afraid to associate with me after that. Because they was afraid that if they associated with me, that I was going, my family was going to plot some plot and was going to probably kill some white folk. And that was the initiative 
to get us out of town. And so I ended up going to California. He might have been in the church, but I suspect he was just watching the girls come out, watching the girls. Cause, you know, as we talked later on, he had come down there to find him a wife. And he was watching the girls. He wasn't studying church. And that's what John saw me. <laughs> and you know what he told me? I know who will make me a good wife. He was talking about me. John called my mama and asked my mama if he could have me. And she told him, yeah. And he sent me $75 to buy me some clothes with you know, get ready to come to California. He, I was in Mississippi and he was in California. He had just come out of, well, he was on his 21 day furlough. He was uh, in this army. And I, mama took me shopping. I never had that much money. Mama took me shopping. I bought me a suitcase and a dress for, for me to marry in. And some underclothes and stuff. And I went on to California on the train. It took me three days to get there. I always say the greatest, one of the greatest things happened to me, of course, is coming to know Christ. The second greatest thing happened to me, I think would have been my discipleship. I think the third great thing that overshadows all of that, that ties all that together, is my Marin Vera May. He uh, met me at the train station. He and another friend of his. And I, I'm scared. No one ever had been out of Mississippi. I put on that dress. We got there. We're in the wedding chapel. I put that dress on and kind of tried to look good. And, and uh, he was looking pretty good with a soldier suit on. And uh, we went in there in the, wedding, in the wedding chapter, and I don't know who it was that married us. We had one man standing on this side, one woman standing on this side as witness. So we said, I do. It's been I do ever since. Virme is a tough person, and I don't believe that anybody else could have. Uh, stayed with me outside of Vera May. I was a strong girl. I had pig cotton, I had plowed. I was a strong. And I could go to the hospital and have those babies. I remember one of those babies I had, I didn't have no prenatal care. And he took me over there and I just had the baby and he came on home the, about the second or third day. And I enjoyed having a family. I enjoyed my children. I enjoyed raising my family. Sometimes I think I married uh, what I wanted my mother to be and what I wanted my wife to be. And so I think I married my mama in Vera May. It lasted for 58 years. I wanted to be married and I, it worked out. Daddy and Mama are a, a, a match made in heaven. God gave her to me. She was my great gift. Spencer, in his own little way, about three and a half or four years old, when he first heard about Jesus, he sort of fell in love with Jesus. And it was through him falling in love with Jesus that he invited me to go with him to his a little church Sunday school where he was going. And it was there for the first time in my life I came under the influence of the Word of God. And uh, you know, it was really that Galatian passage. I grew up without a mother. I grew up without a father deeply in my life. I grew up without an institution of love, the family. But now I had my own family and I love Spencer so deeply. 
And then we'd be talking about things that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And when I began to hear that message, I began to think of the depths of that love. And what I discovered really, that I hadn't had that deep uh, family, nurturing father and mother's love. And so I think I had a point of reference because when I saw my father for the first time, when I was about, probably about three years old, um, that was a, that was a, a, for the first time there was somebody who deeply loved me. And I think in his own way, I think he planted that seed of love. And so I think I understand something of a father, son, uh, a love. And so I wanted to remember Spencer in that way. Mama Wilson, who became my mother later on in life, after I was converted, uh, an old lady in uh, Monrovia, she had one son, and by the time I was converted, uh, she nurtured me. Then when I was away, coming back to Mississippi, to, to find out where I'm gonna stay, I was away, away for six weeks. During that six weeks, her son, only son, got killed. And when I came back home, she took me, the grief was so tough on her and her husband. They only had one son and he got killed in a car accident. And what she did was they took me and placed me in that position that their son was in. And they loved me with a love that is, uh, that I found, I had a family. It took a lot for me to, for her to come back. I got sick and she realized that it was the emotion of sickness and it had to do with me, my desire to come back to Mississippi and that she was sort of standing in the way of that. The Lord made me know if I didn't say I would go to Mississippi, I was going to lose him. And I had just four or five babies then and I couldn't lose my husband on the kind of me. And so I told, got her on my knees by that bed, and I prayed, Lord, I'm not willing to go, but help me, make me willing. And you know, after that, it seemed like a shackle just fell off me. And I, I was ready to go before he was. So we came back to Mississippi together. I had four children come across the country. And as we rolled along, we would stop, eat, and have fun. We enjoyed the trip, but when we got ready to go to sleep, and when they, we drive up to a motel, it wouldn't be no, no lights, you know, saying what it said after they saw us drive up. The light start flashing. No vacancy, no vacancy. Just because we were black, we couldn't go in and sleep, you know. And I remember one time, JP got so tired, he got out and laid down on the grass by the car, on the side of the road, on the ground. I slept in the, in the front seat with my baby in my lap and my, my and Philip was asleep in the window. And Spencer, he was a big boy, pretty good sad boy. He, we, we rested in the car while JP slept on the ground until we got ready to go. It was one of the few hours we were stopped. Then we ended up in Menin Hall. We started our ministry together. And then she would go around and lead in the songs in the schools that I would go to the schools and teach the Bible. And God just opened up a, a massive opportunity. The timing was absolutely right. And then we would go out into the community and teach the lessons on flying boy. And when we got here, we did the same thing. We started going into the public schools. And we came over here to uh, New Hem High School. 
There's a lot of schools. We're going to about 15 schools a month. And that's the way we started our ministry. Then after that, school became uh, desegregated. And then we had to stop that. We began to think about how could we involve the church into development and improving human life. And so we started health center here, we started a farm here, eventually started the school here and started other things here. There was a lot going on, a lot of marches, a lot of uh, people coming from all around trying to help the situation like Doug Homer um, and Curry Brown. And then we had some brave black men in the community who uh, joined my father in um, trying to organize us and uh, see what we could do to make Mendenhall a better place to live. Jesse Newsom was an old World War I veteran, but every white folks and black folks respected him. He heard me teach and he fell in love with my teaching. And then when we integrated the idea of helping people in the community and voting and registering people to vote, he took it on and he registered over 3,000 people himself. I remember the first time I registered I registered right there in the back of that old post office there in Minnehaha. And the Voters League, and they call a me meeting, the, the Civic League, call an organization, the Civic League. And we just started from there. I was able to get some money from the uh, voters movement uh, that was a part of the Civil Rights Movement and then uh, and from the Labor Department. And they made me sort of the Civil Rights Movement, sort of put me in charge about five or six counties. That's the way they did. They created regional representatives. We were sort of like shadow congressmen for the people in that district. And so they would give the money to me. The money came through me to those counties as I went out and organized them, and they decided on how much money they needed to sort of carry out the voters' registers drive, and most of that was just to buy gasoline. That was about it. So I would make those, I'd get people together, and they would agree that we're gonna register all the blacks in this county. And then we would get somebody like Brother Jesse or somebody else, and that they would then, we'd organize an organization in that community. You, you understand? That would sort of use the money. And so Brother Jesse Newsom became the pivot guy of a, then he became a part of my board of directors, on my board of directors, so did Mr. Buckley. They gave their leadership character to me. Um, my dad didn't work for white people, so he got pushed to the forefront. All the other uh, black men worked for white people and they were afraid they were gonna lose their job. My dad didn't have, to, didn't have that to worry about. So being the leader that he is, he became, he became the main leader and the mouth for uh, the little Mendenhall struggle. And that they was looking for a person who wasn't tied down to the white people. I would listen to them make lists of things that they wanted from the white people downtown for them to start doing to treat us better. And then every week, uh, every Saturday, we would march as a way of showing them that we just were not, just wouldn't be sitting back and letting them continue to do what they were doing and treating us that way. I'm not a brave person, but I never was afraid. I never was afraid. As we get through what I mean, who leading the march? I'm leading the march with two or three other men. It's just as we go out into the street, those, I remember one time, 
the National Guard, they was standing all the way across there. And I was singing and leading a song, do right, white man, do right, before I get mad. <laughs> so we would uh, start out at um, our house where we were, where we lived, in our church. And we would march through the black community, the quarters. Then we'd go across the tracks, because we lived across the tracks. And once you get across the tracks, you're in a white, white folks neighborhood. And uh, we walked across the tracks, and then we, we walked downtown. I don't know if I was, I don't think I was afraid. I know I wasn't afraid. I don't know, I must have been trusting. <laughs> I wanted to come because when the marches were going on, and you know, uh, you know, Vera Mae was was telling Mama about everything that was happening, and and uh, she was saying, you know, she wanted me to come and be a part of that, you know, that that they were opening some doors, and you know, and it was a struggle, and it was hard. And medical working on integration, voter registration, and boycotts. Don't hurt them, boycott them, and money is the worst, the most important thing. And we began to get black folks registered. There were less than 5,000 blacks in the state of Mississippi registered to vote. We realized that our problem came from elected officials. Because you could kill a black person, a nigga in them days, the word was, kill a nigga in them days, always just another dead nigga. They're not going to try to convict nobody for killing a black a Negro. So we found out you got to get registered and you got to vote. And voting people who help you and protect that. Uh, during the boycotts, that was kind of a scary time. It was kind of a time where they let you know where you could and couldn't go. You know, sometimes people ask me what is, uh, talk about fear, fear, and what is courage. And I always like to say courage is the, is the management of fear and making the decision you ought to make in the face of fear and moving forward with it. A little bit after that, they started to develop co-ops and I would travel with them to different places in Mississippi for where he's trying to start the co-ops. I think I had such a burden for the poor and broken. And so for those years, in from 67 to 75, you might say, I worked with developing cooperatives as a basis of dealing with the poor, helping them to take their resources that they had and invest in them. That's what cooperative is all about. I got to meet a lot of these older guys that he was working with and just sitting and listening to all that wisdom, being a little boy. And now I think back on how they were trying to change uh, America, not just Mississippi, but they were changing America the way people would think. And that was incredible just to be with them all that time. During the Civil Rights Movement, when we integrated the different places, we had to make certain that those places was integrated each week because otherwise uh, people would be too fearful to go there. Not only did we had to integrate them, but we the same civil rights movement had to keep them open by integrating them until our own people overcome their fear. And they would go to those places and feel like it was okay to go there. So it was a difficult, fearful time Hey, what you doing in here in that segregated lunch counter? You want to know but I got me some ketchup. I'm going to squirt it all over your face. And you, young lady, you really ought to know better. I got me some mustard. I'm going to squirt it all over your face. And you, don't you be smiling. I got me a hamburger. I got me a milkshake. I'm going to squish that hamburger in your face. I'm going to pour that milkshake all over your head. You going to do anything about it? I didn't think so. And you, young lady, you really in here with these these colored folks trying to integrate this lunch counter i got me a cigarette not only am i gonna flick the ashes in your face i'm gonna put the cigarette out on your shoulder you gonna do anything i didn't think so and you i'm gonna take you i'm gonna pull you off this stool i'm gonna kick you in the stomach and you i'm sick and tired of all of you i'm taking you to jail in fact all of you get in the paddy wagon let's go Mendenhall and d -Lo, where we live uh, uh, Herbert Jones, who worked for us, he integrated the truck stop. Then my wife, they took him to jail, and uh, put him in jail, and we got him out of we got him out of jail. 
And then what we had to do then, we had to keep the places integrated. That would free other folk because other folk had to see the place was really integrated to go there. And it became my time and my group's time to integrate it that day. And so we'd go to Jackson for Mendenhall, which is about 35 miles. And we began, we was talking about what we were going to do. Well, we went up to Jackson, we took care of our business, and then we began to think about it. it, it I think it was three of us. And we were then thinking about coming back. And so we went round to the bus station. That's before automobiles were so plentiful because there would be people at the bus station wanting to go to Minute Hall, waiting on the bus. And so we could always pick them up and uh, take them with us. And probably they would even uh, give us a little gas money. It would get them home. And so we went round there, but we needed some bodies in order to go with us to jail to be integrated, but we didn't tell the young man. We went around there, and the young soldier, we knew him from Mendenhall. He had been in our Bible classes and all that, and so he was just thrilled to get a ride with us back to Mendenhall, and that was perfect for us because that gave us more ammunition. They're going to beat up or uh, they're going to arrest a soldier. He's home from Vietnam. And they're going to arrest him and beat him. So we got us up that we, we don't say a word to him about it. And so we went there, got to the truck stop, and we got a truck stop. He had been away overseas. He probably thought the chains have changed while he was gone. But we went into the truck stop, and here was here all of these black folk couldn't drive these big over the road trucks. So it wasn't enough for these white folk, these big white men with their big stomach. And of course the highway patrol and Mississippi had put on 600 highway patrols to be the Gestapo's. They was there to make certain that these Northern white folk and these black civil rights workers would stay in play. And so we went in. And we sit on the table and the white waitress, of course, she comes over, uh, but in fact, she, uh, goes back and talk to the manager and the manager we could see him said serve him serve him and so we she brought the silverware out and uh and put the silverware on the table i'm sort of the leader you know of the group and she put the silverware on the table beside of the uh uh the plate and uh and when i went to pick up the silverware uh, my hand was so trembling to, it was like I was calling a meeting order, you know, bing, 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 bing. And what I did was then, I'm so nervous, I sit down on my hand like this. I have to sit down on my hand like that to keep, my, keep them from seeing me shaking. Then people ask me today, what happened? What did you do? I say we integrated the place. That was the task. Uh, we managed our fear. <laughs> we took control of our fear and we obeyed God and we did what we were supposed to do. A Spencer, the one who passed away, and Philip, they integrated the all white public school up there in Mendenhall. My mom would take us to school every day, and every day we were harassed. Every, every morning she was harassed. She had to show her driver's license every morning. Marsha be directing the traffic. He would always stop. I stop. Hand me your driving license. I give him my driving license. He throw him back in my lap. The other great event in my life was when we was um, locked up in the Brandon jail. They knew that if they captured the students, that John Perkins would come to try to rescue them. And so they picked them up and carried them to Brandon. And three of us got in a van, got in a car, a Volkswagen, to go to Brandon to try to make bond to get those kids out. When we got there, that was the best thing that ever happened as far as they're concerned that they had sucked us into that place. So it was really an ambush. And man, they tortured us that night in that jail. Now that was absolutely torture. I first saw him on television and he described how, what they had done to him. So we were sitting around the TV and he talked about the fork that they bent and stuck up his nose until it bled. Beat us, stamped us. 
he talked about the gun. They put it to his head and clicked it and telling him every time I'm going to kill you, nigger, and click it. I thought they was going to kill us. Uh, blood was everywhere. At one point, they made us mop up our own blood, mop up my own blood off the floor. And I, I knew they had us there and that there was no end to that outside of death. We went up there and when I got inside the jail, he, oh, sh the sheriff said, you leave your purse here. So we left our purse. And I went upstairs and they brought JP out. He had a hole up the top of his head that the doctor drew a bucket of cold blood, I mean a cup of cold blood out of him. And I said, what's wrong? I didn't know it had been beaten. And I said, God, if you let me out of this jail tonight, uh, I said, I, I want to preach a gospel that could save these people. Vimey, get me out of here, Vimey. Get me out of here because they're going to get me first. What? And that was a real sad time. So we went back out and tried to find somebody to get them out. And I think that is when reconciliation was somewhat confirmed. Because it was, it was so confusing to see how they behave and to see the torture they tortured us with. And me and the other students. Mr. Rubin, the, the guys who lived in that county, knew this lady, she had some land, a lot of land. Her husband must have died. She walked in there, she signed it, signed the book so he could get out. And the, and the, the officer said, call her name, you stay out of that mess. Ain't gonna do nothing but get your, your land taken away from you. You stay out of that mess. She had like she didn't hear him. She went up there like a brave soldier and signed, going on his bond, getting him out. And I don't know, I never didn't know that lady. I wish I could have known her. She was a real blessing to us. Well, I got out after that torture. And I wanted to, in my heart, to not do that. I wanted in my heart to not, I wanted to forget about what I had promised God. I knew I would promised him that. I knew I would said it. And now I'm out. Stupid, Curry Brown, and Reverend Brown. Those are the three. And to see them hug each other and cry was something else. Something else. How they just hug and cry. Ron Brown said, John, I knew you were going to get me out. You know, so he even knew he didn't nobody know him. When my daddy got beat really bad, and he was in the hospital in Mount Bayou, and my mother would drive up there probably once or twice a week to visit him. And on the way up there, uh, it was a three-hour trip, but on the way up there, she would be looking like this, you know, all frowned up. And I remember like the first or second time I said to Mama, I said, Mama, what's wrong? And she said, oh, nothing, baby. I'm just thinking. Not really understanding how deep everything was, was because I was only uh, four years old at that time. And uh, so every time we would get in the car for that three hour and take that three hour drive, I would say, Mama, you're not upset, huh? You just thinking. And it was in that hospital that I got so I couldn't read my Bible. And when I would read my Bible, it looked like every time I would open my Bible, it would fall open to that place in Matthew where Jesus says, if you can't forgive those who trespassed against you, how do you expect your Heavenly Father to forgive me? And that haunted me. Then when he finally came home, 
he uh, he he had this look in his face that when he looked at me that I will never forget. It was like um, it was almost like sort of like embarrassment, but it was like uh, what I read in his face was like I could not I. I feel like a failure because I couldn't take care of y'all. You know, I could not protect you from these people. And that's a look I'll never forget. And we kept on, we kept on, um, we kept on fighting and kept on marching and kept on trying to do what was right. God gave me a model of forgiveness. He brought into my life an old white policeman here in Jackson, a Mr. King, when I was holding some tent meetings here in town. And I didn't like him. I didn't want to like him. He looked too much like the policeman who beat me. But he kept working with me. He didn't even know what he was doing, I don't think. But everything I wanted to do in any way he could help me, he helped me. It was almost like he loved me through the most crucial time in my life. And there came a time when I could look at a policeman without getting angry. That's when I knew I was being healed of my own racism. Really, tell you the truth, I don't feel bad towards them. They were blind, you couldn't see. I don't feel bad, I feel sad that it was that way. My mama says to daddy, she say, Toop, Toop, you know, she called him Toopy. She says, Toop, Shorty Timms is over there at the other table. And Shorty Timms was one of the um, men who had beat daddy up in the Brandon jail. And I looked, and as a little girl, I never knew what he looked like. So I was like, I kind of looked back and I was like, oh, I want to see who this guy is. So I look over and I look at him and I see him and he and his wife kind of saying the same thing. Look, look, they're Reverend Perkins and his wife. And at the end of our lunch, my parents both got up and went over and greeted them. And I was just kind of like, saying to myself, man, you know, he prayed for this forgiveness and this reconciliation stuff. Um, and he really meant it. And, uh, and I, it was, to me, it was just a great example of how God forgives and, and redemption is possible. Oh, I don't know why I'm crying so. How redemption um, is possible, you know. Uh, we all um, can be redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Uh, Mr. Robert Archer Buckley was a person who came to live in Simpson County, Mendenhall, and he had come there probably uh, 10 or 12 or more years before I got there. And when I started my teaching program, he would come in to the teaching, he'd get somebody to bring him in. And that he says that he was longing for someone to come to town who would uh, really teach the Bible and to try to get people to live by the Bible. And what was one of the things that was outstanding about him is that he really loved the Word of God and loved the teaching. And he got Miss Fanny into that too. And so in Mendenhall, the gym was named after him. And he was such a thorough guy when we started the church that he would, uh, he would keep in count of all the eggs and all of the money he made from his cow. And he would make certain that 10% of it went to the work. And that was pretty substantial amount of money back in those days. I think he became that father 
in my life that I so desperately uh, needed. And I was telling Mr. Butler what I was going to do. And we was going to win those young folks to Christ, disciple them, help them to stay in school, go off to college, come back. Now this is happening. It has happened. And I said to him, now what we're going to do, Mr. Buckley, we're going to now go to Jackson and we're going to develop a, a center. We're going to develop near Jackson State University so that we can reach these kids that's coming here from all over the state of Mississippi and we can win some of them and disciple them and get them to go back to their community and reproduce what we are doing here. And I said, then we want to develop a, a study center with these young folks who come foreign from all over the world. They was coming from all over the world, young white people and black from all over the world coming here to be with us. And I said, uh, uh, we're gonna send them back around the world. He understood it. He said, what you wanna do now, you wanna go to Jackson, and what you wanna do there is plant a seed bed. And then you wanna take from that seed bed those sparks like you planted here you want to put those plants all around the United States and the world. That's exactly what we have done. And then we left here after being here for about 11 years and went to Jackson and we started the same thing. And we stayed there for about another 11 years. And then we went to California. By this time, we had sort of developed a philosophy. The key then is this, this three principles. The first one is then relocation. Relocation is incarnation. Relocation is making the people's needs of their own. Re relocation brings us into the community and then we begin to work with the people within the community. We have a great little Chinese poem that sort of sums up relocation. It says something like this, go to the people, live among them, love them, plan with them, learn from them, start with what they know, build on what they have. And we said the best leaders, when our work is finished, our task is done, the people in the community will say, we've done it ourselves. The second one is what we call reconciliation. That's what the gospel is uniquely designed to do. That is a belief system and a deep belief system that you believe that God is able to burn through racial and culture barriers. I think we got to think some things supernatural. And that's what the gospel is. It's the, super, it's the love of God releases the supernatural power of God in our lives. And that we see God as being powerful enough to break down these racial barriers. And that we know that we've done that when we begin to love each other. Reconciliation is not a, just like justice, it's not a status, it's a process. It is ongoing. God is always reconciling all things to himself. But since race is such a big deal, we sometimes then make racial reconciliation everything because it's the one that creates war and violence. In our, in our society. The third one is, um, is redistribution. Now this one gets controversy. It sounds so much like communism. It sounds so much like holding everything in common it, it, in, in, in life. And it sounds like then uh, you're going to take all the money from the rich and give it to the poor. That's not the first thing in redistribution. I think the first thing in redistribution is, uh, is, is ideas. It's believing in inherited dignity of people. And with the right information, the right understanding, people can create wealth. So education, motivation, incentives, all those things are the thing we're talking about. It's on the basis of that, then the resources are, uh, are made and developed. And once you develop a philosophy, and as you travel around the country, you'll see this philosophy is relevant anywhere. Successful people leave the ghetto and leave the weakest leadership there. And then they come back there and do some kind of patronizing stuff, but they never give the people the idea that those young folk could come back to that community 
And so we had sort of developed that philosophy of helping young folks to come to know Christ, go off to school, get some skills, come back to the community. And so we could see that was a need in every pretty much ghetto in the, in the nation. I think Spencer died of a, of a, of a broken heart. Spencer wanted to have a relationship with people where that they was in his life and he sort of married a Mennonite girl who come who represented a sense of stability at least symbolic of stability and then when they started this commune community I think it came out of that desire that I want to be with somebody who want to live their life out together in their faith and uh, and of course uh, that's what this community was it was a it was a beautiful place to be here with those families. But, it, but internally, it was always a real struggle. And I don't think they brought other people into their life, to the community, until right the last year of it. When it and that's when they began to see that they needed outside help in the neighborhood, in the community. The Spencer Perkins Center uh, was named after my late brother Spencer. My dad had a dream one night, and the, the dream was so vivid until it shook him, and he got up and he ran to his window, and he looked outside because he thought he heard bulldozers, and, and, uh, and he was late for an appointment with the bulldozers and the people who were coming to help build the center here. Uh, he went back to bed. And he said to my mom, Vera May, uh, we have to build this youth center. Spencer was a competitive guy. He always pulled off everything we asked him to do. Like he, we asked him to integrate the schools, he integrated that. He integrated the basketball team, they, he led them to a championship. Everything that he was asked to do, uh, he figured that he had been able to do it well. But he never was able to uh, reconcile the lack of, of of their own discipline, he thought, over against the world's discipline, and that they had, they didn't have the resources, and other people, you had the resources. I think that was a, that was a burden that he always lived lived with. And you know, just over the years, uh, from uh, our mission teams, have just been great in and just really helping us build the Spencer Perkins Center. He asked me to come and work for the foundation and start a, a, up the youth program here. And so I came on to start, um, but that's not what I started doing. I started doing everything else. You know how it is at, at, at nonprofits. <laughs> You do what needs to be done. Well, I think we have a a bright future because JP started with that much. We're starting with this much, you know. And he's given us a good base to work from. And my daddy um, said, open your Bibles to Zechariah 8. And I opened my Bible and it was just like I had heard this verse for the very first time. Now I had heard it before growing up, um, but this was the first time that I had heard it this way. And it, in the verse, it talks about um, old people being able to, uh, with walking sticks, once again sit around, and children being able to play in the streets. And oh, and I was just like, oh my goodness, that's, that's the vision for the future. The good things that are going on with the Zachariah 8 program, um, the vision of the new leadership as far as raising up leaders in the community uh, to be, number one, Christians, and number two, good citizens uh, in the community. Uh, the vision is here, it's been set, and, uh, and we're excited about what the future holds for the foundation. I see it as a wonderful opportunity to keep something that's bigger than myself going. It's something that is going to reach throughout Mississippi and different, um, different other arenas. 
Our foundation is helping others reach their dreams for their community. The John and Vera May Perkins Foundation is taking on new leadership uh, because I, uh, my grandparents are passing the torch to us and, and all of their lives they've been striving to raise up indigenous leaders and, and, and it's us as a family and others that are, are surrounding us have taken that torch. We got new minds, fresh ideas, and we're gonna come and we're changing, we're gonna sort of help come change the culture of what everything, how everything's been going. And it's, I'm excited, we, we, we're raising the bar. As the foundation moves forward, it is important for us to continue the legacy of John and Vera Mae Perkins through our training center, through Christian Community Development Workshops, through uh, just hands-on grassroots. That is something that um, we will never lose, the, um, the idea of, of being hands-on. We may grow to be this big organization, but we will never um, not be with the people. First Chronicles, the 12th chapter. And in that entire chapter, uh, the writer is, is reflecting on the time right before David becomes king. Uh, and what's happening in that chapter is that David is on the run. He's running for his life, literally, because uh, Saul, King Saul, wants his head. Uh, David is God's uh, choice, but he certainly isn't Saul's choice. And so as we get into the 23rd verse of, of 1 Chronicles 12, it tells us about these warrior groups that, that met David at a place called Hebron. And for what purpose? For the purpose, the text says, for turning, uh, for turning Saul's kingdom over to David as the Lord had said. So what we find here is actually a political coup but it's a divinely initiated political coup. And then further down in that same passage, one of my favorite verses, when you get to verse 32, between verse 23 and verse 32, you have, the, uh, you have these warrior groups listed in the thousands until you get to verse 32. And what's interesting is that verse 32 represents the smallest of these, of these warrior groups and yet probably the most influential. Verse 32 says, and of, and of the men of Issachar, men who understood the times in which they lived so that they can give direction to God's people. I believe that the foundation and the uh, leadership, the new leadership of that foundation represents, represent the 21st century sons and daughters of the tribe of Issachar of persons who are beginning to understand the times in which they live so that they can give direction to God's people. That is what the three R's are gonna look like in the 21st century. Reconciliation, relocation, redistribution, but it will look in ways differently in the 21st century than it was when John Perkins conceived of those three R's uh, almost 40 years ago. I think about uh, often when I will not be here. And uh, based on the leadership, the broad base of leadership in Mendenhall Bible Church with deacons and uh, elders, this plurality of leadership and giving the young ministers in the church a chance to preach and giving the elders in the church a chance to preach. I do basically most of it, but I also always give them a chance to do it, either Sunday morning or Wednesday night. We are preparing them for leadership for the future. You all took us out of a rut here in Mendenhall. Many of the young people in um, New Ham Attendance Center because we had to work in the fields, picking cotton and hoeing sweet potatoes. Many of us had given up on education. You know, we had no desire for learning. We, we had just given up. 
and you all took us in and you gave us a new beginning. You helped us to get out of the rut and realize that there is, there is life outside of Mending Hall. There is life outside of Mississippi. And you opened our eyes and gave us new vision by allowing us to travel with you. And so we thank you and we appreciate everything that you have done. You have been a blessing to our lives. There's so much work to be done. And the Bible teaches us that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And I'm just seeking whom I can to join me and the Perkins Foundation and ministry to continue on this legacy. They both had a real heart to develop young people and to see young people grow in some basic areas. What is God saying? What is God saying? God is not saying all of this gimme, gimme, gimme. Gimme, gimme, gimme. And this prosperity theology. God is going to give me this. He's going to give me this. He's going to give me that. That's what I hear today. And we caught into that. We caught into this consumerism and we're addicted to it. This consumerism stuff. Listen, let's listen to the voice of God. This is the, heart, the key of my message. Let's hear God speak. Let's see what God is saying. God is up and down the streets. God is forever listening. He, God is forever calling. God is out there and he's speaking. He's speaking. Let's hear what God is saying when he speaks. Listen to what he said. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who will go for me? As my parents have aged, um, they, you know, have always been looking outside or looking for someone who can fill their shoes and um, what we found out was that nobody can fill my dad's shoes they got to have their own shoes. Brother Perkins we enjoy when I say we Rosie and all the 25 or 30 other kids who you took into your home you and sister Perkins took into your home we really enjoy the family experience you know it was very rewarding and we felt good and we felt happy just being a part of the family. He is so wise and curious and probing and he's not intimidated by anything. And he can almost solve any problem. He, he at least can break a problem down into manageable parts where it seems almost manageable. Huge things, systemic problems. Looks at poverty in the urban community and says, you know what? The families are broken. So let's just work with children and their parents, bring them to Christ, give them some tools that they need to get out of that cycle of poverty, and maybe we'll start seeing our communities changed. And when he puts it like that, when he takes this huge problem and breaks it down into these manageable parts, working with kids, uh, working with their, their parents, uh, it gives us hope. John Perkins for me, was a pastor, preacher, and for the first time I met a pastor, preacher, who was not in a suit walking around, but who put on his coveralls, was willing to go out and play softball, was willing to go out with a hammer and nails and work on somebody's house. I was fascinated by that. When I would see him, you know, he was president of the ministry, president of Boys of Calvary, and he would be out there sweeping the yard, you know, whatever needed to be done, he just got there and did it. Whether Dr. Perkins is speaking at a commencement address in front of thousands of people, eating my mom's apple pie around her dining room table, at the jail speaking to imprisoned youth, telling jokes to volunteer groups, um, or even making pear preserves in his kitchen, he's the same guy. He's the same real broken prophet. Um, he lets people into his life, in, into his own pain and struggles. And that's a really special thing for a leader to do for his followers. I think their legacy will be that everybody's supposed to have a part in making sure that the poor are not suffering and that the poor get opportunities 
you know, to rise up and get opportunities that you see other people having. The legacy that, that Dr. Perkins and uh, Grandma Perkins leave here, um, it's a legacy, it's almost like a, um, they're walking libraries and it's so much history in, in them. And so in, in that history, we have to learn from them. We have to learn from the mistakes and also learn from the victories as well. The, thy kingdom come, that's in the Lord's Prayer, is your community that you're placed in on earth, not some figment of imagination when you die and go to heaven. And so I think that that's their legacy. They've really pushed working for the community, working for the everyday people. And we grew up uh, multiculturally. We've always had a mixture of people uh, in our house, in our ministry, all around. And it has made us better people because of it. But they fought for humanity and the people of Mississippi and uh, the people of Mendenhall. And so uh, those are what heroes uh, are supposed to be. And they are truly uh, two of my heroes. They both sort of taught a value of, of leadership development. How in the world do we pour ourselves into the lives of others and watch those others develop in, in a great and fantastic way? I take away that he stood for something. And he wasn't complacent with just you know, all the work that he did in the civil rights movement got him somewhere. But he wasn't all right with just leaving it there. There was something else that still needed to be done and to dedicate the rest of his life when it wasn't the biggest thing on the news and it wasn't, you know, he didn't get all the fame for it, but he was able to you know, put his life towards something. And I, I really think that is the legacy that I will take from him. Uh, the stories from the civil rights movement of, of his experience in, in the jails and his experience in Mendenhall and the boycotts and the marches, all that stuff is so powerful. And it, it can really get you in a place where you want to stand for something yourself. John and Vera Mae Perkins represent uh, those persons who are actually living out the combination of good news and good works. And in terms of community development, their legacy is going to uh, impact uh, communities of faith in terms of what it means to holistically develop communities of need in ways uh, quite novel, in ways that uh, many evangelicals, white and black, uh, simply have not done. So therefore, John and Vera may function, have functioned as role models uh, in terms of how one lives out uh, a gospel that is both, that is, uh, both reconciling, a gospel, that, uh, is in, uh, a gospel that is engaged in uh, a, a, a holistic community development, and how that looks in terms of social justice, in terms of, uh, in terms of systemic issues. So that legacy is, 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 is really multidimensional. I mean, uh, I, I'm at a point right now where I'm just listening. You know, my mother has this saying. She says, I don't know what the Lord's doing, but I'm glad to be a part of it. And that's the way I feel being here at the, at the foundation. And that's the way I feel when I'm around her. You know, I don't know what God is doing, but I'm, I'm absolutely glad to be a part of it. My mom has this saying. God's work done God's way will not lack God's supply. My mother has been the backbone of this family, the backbone of this organization for 50 years. I tell her she has a new role. You know, she doesn't have to be in the office anymore. She doesn't have to be opening the mail and doing the, the, the accounting. I said, but her role is for us to be able to come down to the house and ask her um, any, kind, any type of question and her um, uh, spread wisdom to us. He'll be remembered as, and my mom too, as uh, civil rights leaders because they were the first ones in Mendenhall to rise up and do something.
only thing significant here is when we were getting out here with Dr. Martin Luther King was shot. One day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Free land of liberty, a V.I. saying. Land where my fathers died. You've been through that. Land where those pilgrims plow from every mountainside. I want to say that morning, freedom was reigning. And, and it wasn't freedom given to us. It was a freedom that we claimed for ourselves. And I want to say this to our young, particular to our young black people. We're going to get as much now as we earn. The day of expecting other people to do more for us is over. The opportunity is here. And so we're going to use this opportunity to walk around like slouches, to, to, to be lazy and indifferent to the freedom that these people have given their life for, particularly Martin Luther King. And we're going to keep on depending on stuff instead of us taking the responsibility for that that we need to, we need to take. This was, a, this was probably is one of the greatest uh, uh, speeches in the history of of America. I would think it would be equal to Abraham Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address, that why he rallied the nation to uh, free the slave, you might say, uh, Martin Luther King rallied the people to take responsibility for their own lives. And that we got just as much freedom now. If you don't have enough freedom, it's because we didn't take enough responsibility. That's what I wanted to say to you. you young he will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. I'm a debtor, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. As much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you to be at Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, therein the gospel, is the righteous will, justice of God revealed. The gospel encompasses, that message of the gospel encompasses God's justice where Jesus died on the cross to just for the unjust, that he's suffering for you and for me and in that redemption and suffering and that we have experienced, that I've experienced the power of that gospel and the power of that love that redeemed me. And just like Paul could say, from now on, I'm in debt. Not a debt to pay for my redemption. I can't do that. He's the one who helps us understand that for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself is a gift of God. Not a works of his own Well, not by my own works of righteousness, which I've done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. Paul understood that. Well, what kind of debt is he talking about here in this I'm a debtor? It's the debt of gratitude and privilege. It's the great debt of gratitude and privilege that God has allowed me, that have entrusted me with that message, and that I'm in debt. I'm in debt to pay that debt to society. To sh I can do nothing else. I'm like Martin Luther. Here I stand. I can do none other because of the debt of gratitude that I owe to God for his redemptive love and for him trusting me and put me into this ministry and give me the privilege and the pleasure 
to share this gospel, Paul said, among the Gentiles, to reveal his son in me. That is some sense of gratitude, and that should be our mode. And most of the people who I preach the gospel to have no sense of that. Now, it ain't their fault. It's probably my inability to reveal in me the depths of my sense of gratitude to God and to make God's love and his grace and to show that redemption in me and to live it out fully. And, you know, I feel that. I feel that. I feel it. But that's, that's, if there is any great thought, I think I have overcome this idea what my mother's going to say to me. Did you help anybody like me? I think I've tried that. I have organized bread for the world. I spent 20 years on World Vision Board. I spent 16 years on Prison Fellowship Board. I've tried to do that. I've tried to do that. I've tried to do that. But what, what, what I think, what haunts me, did I use all of my faculties? Did I use all of those to make God's love real? God has given me the opportunity to proclaim the gospel to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Have I made Jesus Christ beautiful? Have I made him worthy? Have I made him so uh, wonderful that people would accept him? Would they accept him because of the way I have lived in my life? But did I make him beautiful? I think I have this chance. I have this chance every Sunday morning. I mean, somewhere, sometime, every week. Every, in the morning, Bible study. I have this chance to make Jesus Christ worthy. Worthy. And I feel that sense of debt. That sense of, of obligation. I'm obligated. That's what he's saying. I'm obligated. I can do none other. That's that's what I Paul said, and it, it, it was a it, and and it came out of a not a work righteousness, not a work for righteousness. It came out of a sense of gratitude that this God reached down and found this Osama bin Laden, this bigot, this religious bigot, and turn him around and put him into the gospel and give him the opportunity to proclaim that gospel all over the world. You know, um, I, 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 I hope he say well done. You know, I hope he say well done. I'm not quite satisfied with it. I'm not quite satisfied with it. I'm still like Paul, I'm still uh, stretching out <laughs> that I may know him the way he knew me on that Damascus Road. Yeah, that's, that's that dead. A time to heal for this wrecking bar. A time to feel how far the heart goes in the night. And although we reel from the beck and come. Of the voices that will lead us to the light Where do you go when you go for your night to kneel? What do you pray when you pray on the set of the sun? Why do you ride when you ride on the winding wheel? What do you find when The time to feel how far the reach goes in our life And we will deal with 
the blocking wall and the fences that will hold us in our stride. And where do you go when you go for your nightly meal? What do you pray when you pray on the setting of the sun? And where do you ride when you ride on the wine wheel? What do you find when you found the time has come? The time has come. Won't you?